AIS. I got baptized and um, you know this was 10 years ago I was 19 years of age and he was describing to me um, all the way back then you know this idea of what happens when I die and he was just unpacking all of these scriptural truths and it got to a point where I said okay I think I want to come to church with you and he's like okay I go to church on Saturday and the first words out of my mouth, this is no kidding, I said, oh, you're in a cult. I get it. And he said, no, 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 let me explain this to you. So I didn't really understand why there were so many denominations that uh, went to church on Sunday and then very few that went to church on Saturday. And that's what we're going to be unpacking tonight, how that change happened and what exactly happened through all these years that it changed. So, you're in store for, uh, for, for a nice dessert on this Friday night of how it happened, what happened, and uh, a little bit of unpacking on, on, on maybe the return of that same sort of legislation coming down the, down the pipeline. Let's bow our heads and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this evening. We are so grateful that we can share this space and share this time together. Lord, you have unpacked for many a nights, your truths. Continue to unpack your truths tonight as Pastor Danny speaks and gives a presentation of your word. Let your truth be the only thing that our ears hear tonight. Be with us, and in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. The favorite words. Happy Sabbath. You know, the Sabbath, we have officially moved from the other world to the real world, right? Remember we talked about that? We have entered God's space. I mean, not as just the, the title, the Sabbath holy, but the day is holy. The, the air is holy. The, the sound is holy. We have come to the day that God has set for us to commune with him, to, to charge with him. You know, I was um, looking at this couple, this family, and this young child was always, you know, um, having a hard time concentrating. This child would um, cry a lot, and um, my wife would would discuss, you know, what do you think it is, hon? Why do you think um, this child is crying all the time? Or, and uh, we began to just ask, and then we asked, my, my, wife said, my wife said this, it was, I wonder if the, if the child is eating, you know, because it just doesn't seem right, you know? And then we just, then the next time we met the child again, and it was crying again, and, and it was like, we gave him a little bit of snack, then he stopped crying, and I said, that was it, you know? And a lot of times, like, we try to figure out what's wrong with something, and we realize, well, maybe this, there's easier answers for this. Maybe they just need a little food to make them feel better. Um, you ever heard the word hangry? Is that a word for you, hangry? I'm someone, you're, you're just annoyed, right? You're, you're, just, you're just irritated, and you're just extra little sensitive and a little short, and you're like, wait a minute, I haven't eaten. You know, I'm hungry, and it, and it affects us. Or, or um, well, if you had children, you know if they miss their 1 o'clock nap or their 11 o'clock nap, nap, somehow you missed it. You know when it turns about 4 or 5, you can have one cranky kid. So, so me and my wife are like, oh, please, go to sleep, because we don't want cranky kids, you know, in the, later on in the day, because they need to stay on schedule. I don't think we adults are any better 
if we miss or we don't have Sabbath. When, we, when, we, when we're not recharging, when we're not recharging to the only source of power. Does that make sense? God is the only source of power. There is no other power. I mean, you could try to rest. You could try to eat right. I mean, you could do everything if you want. Eating right, resting right. Doing, but if you're not recharging with the life source, because we are children of God. You are human. You are made by God. And because you're made by God, if you don't recharge with God, you'll always be misplaced. You'll always be a step off. You'll always be like, mm, something's not right. My friend, um, well, he's an older friend. He's like a big brother to me. And um, he is, he's, he's a smart guy, smart guy. And um, he went to med school. And uh, he was top 1% of the class, okay? These are smart people, and he was the top 1%. And I asked him, I was like, man, what, I mean, I, man, are you just, you're a genius, right? He goes, no, Danny, I'm not sure if I'm a genius, because when I was, in my freshman year, I was kind of like in the middle, like 40, 50%. Then I said, well, how did you get to the 1%? And he goes, well, so that's interesting you ask, because... I was in the middle of my med class, and um, God talked to me because I wasn't honoring God. Because when it comes to Sabbath, I was so tired. If you're a med student, I, I, I always know who the med students are. They're in the back row. Okay, yeah, med student, okay? Um, and he says, I wasn't honoring God because I was skipping out on church. Um, even when I go to church, I was sleeping. Um, I was just going home and sleeping all day. And sometimes I'd break Sabbath and start studying even before Sabbath ended, you know, because I was stressed out about school. And one day God had a conversation with him. You know, God talks in a way. And he challenged him. So he, look, he says, you want to be a better med student. I know you want to be a top 10% because he wanted to be a certain doctor. And the only way to, get, to be that doctor, you need to be top 10%. And I know you want that. And God challenged him and said, look, if you want to be that top doctor, I challenge you to keep my Sabbath. And God spoke to him. And then and that day, he made a commitment. He made a commitment. said, God, I'm going to commit my Sabbath to you. Okay? I'm not going to cheat on Sabbath anymore. I'm going to get rest so that I'm not falling asleep during church. Uh, I'm going to go to church every Sabbath. I'm not going to study, I mean, I'm not going to study Sabbath anymore from Friday night to Saturday night. No more books. I'm not opening my books. And this is huge for a med student because they're always studying. Guess what? Two years later, he went from 50% to 99%. Just, just, just think about it. That's a, that's a major change. And it wasn't because he got smarter somehow. God knew. God knows when we're recharging when we are refocusing, when we are reminded of what is truly important, God adds everything to us. There is nothing better for you today to do, to do today than to spend more time with God. Nothing. Nothing. Yes, friends are great. Yes, family are great. But an opportunity, a whole day to just breathe to settle with God, to reconnect with your Father in heaven. That is what Sabbath is. And I pray that as, to be honest with you, I am still learning about Sabbath. I'm still learning. I, I want to know what that means. Or, you know, how can I connect with God in a more deeper, meaningful way? I'm still challenged by that. And I hope you're challenged by that. I don't think Sabbath is a bunch of rules that we get, you know, finally get the rules. No, it's not about the rules you get right. It's about having this deep relationship with our Heavenly Father that He gives you life. And when you got that life, the rest of the week is a breeze. Amen? And whatever the life treats at you, here's the best part. Six days from now, there will be another Sabbath to come. Amen. I believe 
Sabbath is so important. This is why I believe that the devil has attacked it. So we're going to start out with a little video, and we'll come back to me. We have reached a critical defining moment in our story. By isolating the weekly holy day from its biblical roots, church leaders cut off the Sabbath from its source of spiritual meaning. It would become a hollow formality, a political hot potato, a test of authority, and a pawn in a centuries-long power struggle. Sunday was an attractive replacement for Sabbath because Sunday was beginning to draw to itself a certain amount of aura because of new developments in the pagan religion that made Sunday the day of worshiping the sun and thinking of the sun. I suppose it was inevitable that elements of pagan worship would find their way into Christianity. Christians were, after all, a small minority in a distinctly pagan world, a world that worshiped mythical gods, dead emperors, and the invincible sun. Historians commonly date the beginning of the Roman Empire as 31 BC. That's when Octavian defeated the forces of Antony and Cleopatra and came back to Rome to rule as the first Caesar, Caesar Augustus. And it was at that time that he shipped back to Rome two great obelisks. One of those he set up in the Circus Maximus. You know, it was not only that it was dedicated to the sun god, but it was also a very visible sign that Rome had conquered Egypt, that the dedication on it said, Caesar Augustus dedicates this as a gift to the sun, but it also says, because Egypt has been conquered. And so the people who came to the Circus Maximus to watch the games could see not only this dedication to the sun, but also the realization that the Roman sun god had prevailed over the Egyptian sun god. Reports from the mid-first century provide additional evidence of the popularity of sun worship. The notorious emperor Nero commissioned a sculptor to create a statue nearly 115 feet tall, topped with the likeness of his own head in the style of the sun god. When Vespasian built his great amphitheater, which we call today the Colosseum, he took that enormous colossus, colossus is the ancient word for statue, that enormous colossus of Nero, changed the features on the face, and dedicated it to the sun god. Emperor Elagabalus was so devoted to his eastern sun god that he took the deity's name. He brought his god in the form of a black meteorite all the way from Syria to Rome and adopted an eastern lifestyle. And so his eastern dress and his eastern orgies and his eastern behavior uh, brought Elagabalus to grief after four years. And even though his god was sent back, the black stone was shipped back to Syria, that sun worship continued. The ancient historian Plutarch reports how the Roman general Pompey went to the eastern Mediterranean to deal with a problem of pirates attacking commercial shipping. This is about 50 BC. Well, he conquered the pirates, captured them, brought them back to Rome. Turns out the pirates were worshippers of Mithras, the sun god. And from those pirates, the worship of Mithras became very popular in Rome, especially among the military. I think that Roman military men would find Mithras a particularly attractive divinity. He was a warrior himself, fighting for the forces of good. It was a hierarchical religion. And one could progress from grade to grade. There were seven grades of Mithraism, much like in an army. And thirdly, it was a religion of brotherhood and fellowship. They would meet together not only to worship their god, but to eat a meal in common. We hear about Roman soldiers having come back from the east who pray at dawn, facing the east, facing the sun. And this is when we begin to get in Rome a mention of 
Deus Sol Invictus. That is to say, the unconquerable sun god. Unconquerable because the night tries to conquer the sun in each 24-hour period. But at dawn, the sun has survived. The sun has vanquished the night. The importance of sun-worshipping cults in the Roman Empire is shown during the reign of Aurelian, who was emperor from 270 to 275 AD. He established a state religion that included the worship of both the emperor and Sol Invictus, the invincible sun. He tried to unify all religions under the sun god. Diocletian, who came to power in 284, was also devoted to the sun god. He maintained Aurelian's principle of a state religion and even declared himself to be a god. Eventually, he ordered the persecution of Christians. Do you remember when I said to you that the enemy is a liar? And to lie, you need truth. Does that make sense to you? You can't lie in the absence of truth. There needs to be something to lie about. So I told you that Sabbath is a day of recharging, a day of reconnecting, a day of remembering who we are and who God is. And the devil, in his, one of his utmost mastery of deception, took the sun, which is also a way of recharging. Does that make sense? Because the sun does give life, yes? The sun is something that makes us stronger and heals us. So the devil himself took possession of the sun. But it doesn't bring type, the type of connection that the Sabbath was intended to bring. The sun has been an object of worship since the dawn of false worship. I believe the first original false worship was surrounded around the sun. Even today, in 2021, sun worship is very popular. If you don't believe me, just look at even our church today. We have representation of the sun, which is basically Baal worship or basically sun worship. It exists today, it exists in our society, it existed all through time because the enemy, the devil, has always been lying to us. For those who might know what this is, you guys seen this before, Any, anybody? Well, they also respect the sun. You have the two cows bowing down to the sun god, Red Bull. Thank you, Red Bull, for that. Sunday, it has been the greatest counterfeit to true worship. I love my Sunday brethren. I do. People who go to church on Sunday, I love them. There are great people who go to church on Sunday. And, and I'm not trying to put down people who go worship on Sunday. And let it never be said, if you go to church on Sunday, you're lost. No, that's not true. There is an understanding, we'll get that tomorrow and tomorrow night, a little more about that, that comment. But there are a lot of good people who go to church on Sunday. But this is what I have come to understand. Worshiping on Sunday has been a handicap because they're missing out on one of the most, if not the most important part of our Christian faith, which is Sabbath. Sabbath, remember, has been given to us as a remembrance that we are the children of God, yes? Every seven days, we remember that creation happened because the weak cycle only comes from creation. Nowhere found in astronomy or anywhere in history do we find anything about a seven-day cycle except the Sabbath which remembers us about creation. It was so important that God put it in stone about the other nine commandments. Think about it for a moment. 
These are the characteristics of God. This is, this, is his, this is who he is. This is what the government is based on. And the fourth commandment, which is the center commandment of all ten commandments, is remember the Sabbath. That's how important the Sabbath day is. And my, my friend, he, he, we had a Bible study, and we're talking. He said, Danny, do you see something in the Old Testament about the, about the uh, about Judah and about Israel, the old kingdoms. And I said, what? What, what? what do you see? He said, every time these people fell away from God, they always lost the Sabbath. They always lost the Sabbath. Losing the Sabbath always came first. Then they start worshiping Baal and they start crucifying people. Everything goes wrong and always starts with breaking the Sabbath. When we forget the Sabbath, when we forget who God is, when we forget who we are, we get lost. So God put it in stone. Remember the Sabbath to keep it what? Holy. It is God's day. Six days I shall labor. Six days do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God, and it should do what? No work. I, I hope this is good news to you, isn't it? This is good news to you. This is a saying to you, hey, today, no work. No studying, no stressing, no looking at your emails. Just time out. Come on, all you people, isn't that great? What a great day it is. What a great day designed by God. I mean, it's Friday. I don't care what biology test you have on Monday. I don't care what deadlines you have on Monday. You know what? Done with it. You nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, your stranger who's within your gates. For six days the Lord made heavens and earth and the sea and all that is in them and rested on the Sabbath day. This is what God has done. This is what God has given your creator, a day of rest. Therefore, the Lord, this is the cool part, blessed it. There is a blessing to be had on this day. It's like good food. When you eat good food, there's a blessing to be had. When there's a good day, there's a blessing to be had. And it, there's no other day except this day. From Friday night to Saturday night, this is the day that God has ordained that you might be blessed. Because God made it what? Holy. This is a holy day. God created the earth in six days. In the seventh day, he rested. The day God, I mean, I told you in the last sermon, this idea still, it still shocks me. It still shocks me that an eternal God, an omnipotent God would rest. Why would God need rest? Because he doesn't. God never gets tired. But he rested. He put bound. Is it okay to say no? Yes, it is. Just to say no, not really. But say no to the not as important things that you can say yes to the more important things. Does that make sense? So what God has given us by the Sabbath is an ability to say no to the non-essentials and to say yes to the true essential. The Sabbath. Do not add what I command you and do not subtract from it, says in Deuteronomy 4 2. But keep the commands of the Lord your God that I give you. God knows exactly what we need. Is that true or is that true or false? God knows exactly what you need. And this is what the Sabbath is. My covenant I will not break, nor, nor alter the word that has gone from my lips. My friends, Jesus never, ever wanted to change the Sabbath. He never just wanted to give Sabbath to just one group of Jews. Sabbath was for all mankind. It says, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Let no one say that we don't need the Sabbath. Uh, I, like I said, I love my Sunday brethren, but this is one thing I wish they would never say. When they tell me the law has been abolished, I said, 
you can't abolish God. You can't abolish his character. The law is who he is. Even here it says he came to fulfill the law, to live out the law, to live out what God wants, not to destroy. For sure they sent to you till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle by no means pass from the law till it is fulfilled. My friends, Jesus is the example. He is the law testimony lived out. That is who Jesus Christ is. Whoever therefore breaks one of these least commandments and teaches men so shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. And we talked about this. We don't pick and choose what we want to obey. Does that make sense? Right? We can't go to the Bible and say, I like this, I like this, but if I don't like this, I'll cut it out. It doesn't work that way. If the Bible speaks to us, does it, are we accountable for all of it? Yes, we are. We can't pick and choose what we want to follow. No, God is holistic. He is all of it. We don't get to choose part of God. Are we in or are we out? Even Jesus says in Luke, so he came to Jesus of Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day to stood up to read. Jesus came to fulfill. He came to show the world that I, in two, respect the Sabbath. Jesus had many miracles done on Sabbath because he wanted to show them the Sabbath was a blessing for mankind, not a curse. The Sabbath was made for man, not for the man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is all the Lord of the Sabbath. It is a day of joy. Sabbath is a day of life. Sabbath is a day of bringing goodness and purity and kindness to others. We know that the Orthodox Jews have kept the Sabbath from Sabbath to Sabbath for thousands of years. We know for sure that Friday night to Saturday night is the Sabbath day of our Lord. The Bible also writes for us. We find the story of the crucifixion. It was in preparation day, and the Sabbath is about to begin. We know for sure that the Sabbath, Jesus died in the middle between preparation day and between resurrection Sunday. And the woman who came with him from the Galilee followed after, and they observed the tomb and how his body was laid. And they returned, repaired the spice and fragrant oil, and they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. We also we know by the story of Jesus that Saturday was a Sabbath, the day in between preparation day and resurrection day. And Lucas says, now on the first day of the week, when was Jesus resurrected? First day of the week, which we call Sunday. Very early in the morning, they, certain other women with them came to the tomb bringing spices which they had prepared, and Jesus was what? Gone. He had come out. He was resurrected. He had rested on the Sabbath came out on Sunday or the first day. Then what happened? How did we get from Saturday, Sabbath, and how did we get to Sunday? Well, interesting. People have told me, well, maybe the, maybe the apostles, maybe they changed the day. Well, in Acts it says they went into the synagogue on when? The Sabbath. It also talks about this, even the apostle, apostles worshiping on Sabbath and down sat, sat down. When the Jews were gone out of the synagogues, it says, Acts 13, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them. What? The next Sabbath. So the tradition, the belief of the Sabbath was continued even after the death of Jesus. It never changed. The Sabbath never changed. And next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. So it was a tradition for the apostles to come and preach to the people on the Sabbath day. And he reasoned, this is about Paul, in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuade the Jews and the Greeks. The New Testament, you, can, you should say that not one verse that ever changes the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. I will not alter my lips have altered. Jesus says, I will not change anything that the Bible says. The Bible doesn't say one thing and change. That's one thing, that's one beautiful thing about the Bible. It's not just this and suddenly revision. No, whatever you find in Genesis will be consistent even to Revelation. That's the one thing I love about the Bible. 
You could read the entire Bible, and it's consistent. I, I, I'm telling you, I, I want to tell you what a miraculous thing that is. It had to be written by a higher power because that Bible just works together. You may read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, and you will not find a single line authorizing the sanctification of Sunday. There is no such thing as Sunday worship. The scriptures enforce the religious service of Saturday. The reasons we observe the first day instead of the seventh day is based on no positive command. One will search scriptures in vain for authority for changing from the seventh day to the first. So we know that there is no scriptural authority, no scriptural authority from changing from Saturday to Sunday. You can't find one. If you, tell, if you could find one, please let me know. Then I'll tell you, then next, next week we'll all be worshiping on the Sunday or the real day. Is, is that fair? If you could find me a scriptural text, I will tell all of you, let's go. Because that's what the scripture says. And, but the reason we worship on Saturday is because that's what the scripture says. Is that good? We're a people, we should be a people with scriptural belief that the scripture is our guide. Yes? Almost all churches throughout the world celebrate the sacred mysteries, the Lord's Supper, on the Sabbath of every week. Yet Christians of Alexandria and Rome, on account of some traditions, have ceased to do this. So you could tell, it says here in this history book, Christians, early Christians worshipped on Saturday. But then some tradition started creeping into the Christian church. But all through time, there have been Christians who worshipped on Saturday. But the gradual change from 70 AD to 135, as the Christian church began to grow, there was change. It says, beginning with the first Jewish revolt against Rome in 66 to 70, very repressive measures, military, political, and fiscal, were imposed by, the Jew, by Rome upon the Jews. Hadrian, at this time, prohibited the practice of the Jewish religion throughout the empire, condemning especially Sabbath observance. The persecution of church, Christian church had come very early because Sabbath observance was directly in challenge to Sunday observance. And Sunday observance was very important because Sunday observance, you're worshiping the sun god. And who was the sun god at the time? The emperor. Yes? The emperor was a sun god. And if you worship on the another day other than the Sunday, then you were going against the government. Impressive indications suggest that Sunday observance was introduced in the time in conjunction with Easter Sunday. An attempt to clarify to the Roman authorities a Christian distinction and Judaism. So let's say the Jews worship on Saturday. I'm sorry, yes, yeah, Saturday. So let's become non-Jews. So they created an Easter Sunday to make it another holy day to say we are not the Jews. Sunday has been around for a long time. Sun worship, Sunday, even the name. I mean, that's pretty hard to deny, isn't it? We call it Sunday. We know that the Roman government had put into the Christian church a change from the holy day, which was Saturday, to the holiday, which became Sunday. Christians were not the only ones who became careless and gradual and compromised their faith. The erosion of purity of the apostolic church stood stood firm and pure. But when the second and third generation came along, so Christians at Gaza got further along after child rearing, okay, we see evidence of compromise and apostasy. Between the days of the apostles and the conversion of Constantine, which is, was an emperor of Rome, rites, ceremonies, which neither Paul nor Peter had ever heard, slowly crept in use and claimed the rank of divine institutions. Remember we talked about this? Satan's master, master trick? Because previously it was us and them. Christianity or God's church and pagan church. And we talked about this. Satan's ultimate plan was, was to what? Infiltrate God's church. It was, it was a master stroke. 
what a, what, a, what a wonderful thought he thought. He said, I'm going to take over Christianity from the inside. In 321, the first civil Sunday law passed. It had come to the point where Sunday became the official day of Christians. On the venerable day of the sun, let the magistrate and people residing in the cities rest, and let all the workshops be closed. In the country, however, persons engaged in agriculture may freely and lawfully continue their pursuits. So we, here we see that the church began to enforce a Sunday religion. Do you know that in the 1600s, 1700s, they had Sunday religions here in the United States also? They're called the blue laws. In many states, the blue laws are still in the books. You ever wonder why banks are closed? What, what days are banks closed? On Sunday. The post office, well, I don't think it used to, but I still don't think they deliver on Sunday. If you go to Indiana, I live in Michigan. What's, this is kind of funny because I used to live in Michigan, and Indiana has a blue law. They don't sell alcohol on Sunday. I mean, to this day, you can't buy alcohol on Sunday in Indiana. So they would drive to Michigan to buy alcohol on Sunday because the blue law states you can't buy alcohol on Sunday. If you go to many stores in Canada, England, Europe, stores are closed on Sunday. So don't be fooled that it only needs to pass. It's actually here in the present. In the year 325, Sylvester, the bishop of Rome, changed the title of the first day, calling it the Lord's Day. Christians shall not be Judaized. Don't be a Jew, they said. Keep the Sabbath, he said. And be idle on Saturday, but shall work on that day. But the Lord's Day shall be especially honored, and being Christian shall be possible. Do thy work on that day, however they were found Judaizing. They shall be shut out from Christ. Don't be a Jew. Be a Christian. Worship on Sunday, they said. Don't be a Jew, they said. The church, the Christian church, had become transformed. And we read that. Remember in our last, in our last meeting, we talked about how the Christian church changes from the inside out. As the prophets of the, here we go, the Antichrist, remember? The Antichrist, those who opposing Christ began to work within the church. Those who maintain that work ought not to be done on the seventh day. And they realize, hey, this is our chance. We know that Martin Luther fought against the Antichrist, fought against the traditions. The Bible and the Bible as our only thrill of faith. Martin Luther he smelled the rat, didn't he? He smelled something wrong with the Christian church. He said, you know, if we're going to be a Christian church, what should be our rule of faith? The Bible. And this is why Seventh-day Adventists, this is why our church exists today. Do you know that? This is why you exist. We exist because we are carrying out what Martin Luther started 500 years ago. Seriously, we are carrying out the protest movement that Martin Luther started. And this is his Martin thing. He says, the Bible and the Bible only as a rule of faith. The church, the church is the one that changed it. I want to tell you something. It's the church that changed the day. The Catholic church at the time. Now, people might say, the Catholic church... Pastor Danny, you talk about the Catholic Church. Yes, I talk about them because they were the most powerful force back then. And we're going to talk about tomorrow how this movement continues today. One person suggested to me, Pastor Danny, are all Catholics lost? And I want to tell you, no. This is very important. When I tell you Catholic Church, I'm talking about the structure, I'm talking about their systems, I'm talking about their laws. I am not talking about Catholic people. There are many good, faithful Catholic people who are doing the best they can. They're still missing out on Sabbath, but the Lord will continue to work with them. So remember, when I talk about Catholic church, 
It is the structure, not the people. For 1,000 years before the existence of a Protestant by virtue of divine mission, changed the day from what? Saturday to Sunday. This is just plain news. If you look at history, it's there. In the Converse Catechism, this is a Catholic book they teach to young people. They have a Q&A phase. And they'll actually have this. You can actually go to the Converse Catechism, and they'll say this, which is the Sabbath day? This is the Catholic Catechism. They'll say, Saturday is a Sabbath day. Isn't that amazing? In the Catholic Catechism, they'll admit to you that Saturday is a Sabbath day. Okay, fine, great. Well, here's the next question. Then uh, why do we observe on Sunday instead of Sabbath? That's fair enough, right? You just told me Saturday's the right day. Then why do you guys go on Sunday? Well, here it is. Because who? The Catholic Church transferred the solemnity of Saturday to Sunday. Whoa. Time out. Time out. You're telling me that a group of people change the holy day from Saturday to Sunday? You're telling me that a church has authority to change God's word? And the Catholic church will say, yes, we do. Oh, no. Oh, no. This is when me, as someone of, I guess, conscience, I refuse to go along with someone else's authority and this is where my rebellious streak, streak helps. I, I'm, unfortunately, it's a bad person of mine. I have a little bit of rebellion in me. And I have a hard time following rules that are made up or told to me by just, I told you so. Or do it because I'm telling you. I'm not good with that. But if the Bible says it, ooh, that's different. God says it. I'm good. A human says it. I'm not so good with it. I'm not good with human stuff. Like two sacred rivers flowing in paradise, the Bible and the divine tradition contain the word of God, they say. Though these two divine streams are of equal sacredness, oh, this is tough. Still, of the two, tradi- of the two tradition is to us more clear and safe. Okay, stop, full stop. No. No, no. Tradition is not the most important. The Bible is. Yes? Your family might have a tradition. This is, this is really hard for, let's say, a Hispanic family. Many Hispanic families, if you go to Mexico or to many Southern American countries, they've been Catholics for just generations. And they've always go to church on Sunday. Tradition is important. I, I'm a believer of tradition. I, am a, I like tradition. I have many traditions. But tradition can never supersede the word of God. Amen? If tradition tells me that I could slap my wife, I'm sorry. The Bible says, no, you're not. Yes, I obey the word of God. Does that make sense? The word of God supersedes tradition Every single time. Now, if there's good traditions that doesn't bump up into the word of God, be my guest. Enjoy your traditions. Traditions are good, but it can't go above the word of God. We know that for Martin Luther, the protest movement began that we will worship God, that God will be the Bible God. In the Council of Trent, we have this. Finally, at last, opening on the 18th January 1562, all the hesitation was set aside, and the Archbishop Regio made a speech which he openly declared that tradition stood above Scripture. This is the Catholic Church saying, tradition over Scripture. The authority of the Church could therefore not be bound by authority of the Scriptures, it says. Because the church had changed the Sabbath and the Sunday. They said, how do you get this authority? They said, look, this is our authority because we changed the law from Saturday to Sunday. They claim that authority. This is kind of round authority. Who gave you authority? Well, we did. Well, how do you get authority? We changed it. Well, how do you change it? It's kind of weird circular reasoning. Okay? Not by command of Christ, but by its own authority. So they claim Godship. The, the Christian church at that time claimed godship because look at our power because we could change a day. 
The church changed God's law, and then we're fighting it. My friends, we have been on a wrong track. Our Christian churches are on a wrong track. And my friends, we need to get on the right one. We need to tell our Christian brothers who are worshiping on Sunday, and it's no fault of their own because many of them don't know. We need to tell them that there's a Sabbath they're missing out on. And you know what, though? I'm getting a little excited because I've, I bumped into some um, Sunday Christians. Um, one of my favorite Sunday Christians, is, his name is Michael Card, if you know of him. He's a, he's a Christian artist. He's a musician. Wonderful songs. If you want a good Christian music, look up Michael Card. Go YouTube Michael Card. Just scriptural, beautiful music. And um, I, I invited him to, to sing at one of our concerts. So I got to talk with him. And uh, he keeps the Sabbath. He goes to church on Sunday. He, he's, a, he's a member of a Sunday church. I don't know which one. In Tennessee, I think. But him and his family observe the Sabbath. From Friday night to Saturday night, they observe Sabbath. But he knows that's the day that God made holy. But there's nothing wrong with church on Sunday. There's nothing wrong at all. But for him, Sabbath is true. And, I, and not only him, I'm, fi- I'm, I'm finding it other people now. They're finding Sabbath on their own. I, I've, I've even met people who says, hey, you're, you're a church that, that works on Saturday. I go, yeah, okay, I want to check you guys out. It's happening. Actually, it's happened. People are going to our church because they're like, you guys are worshiping on Saturday, just like the Bible said, right? Yes. My friends, I believe this church needs to be here. This church needs to be here because there are people looking for a church that worships on Saturday. And when they Google a Sabbath church, I hope they could come here and worship about God on the day it was intended to be worshipped. The Bible does not change. Why do you also transgress the commandment of God because of your tradition, it says? Why do you stick with your traditions? But in vain, this is interesting, Jesus says, but in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines and commandments of men. As a church, we've got to be careful. We've got to be careful here. Even as Seventh-day Adventists, we've got to be careful that what we teach on the pulpit is not something that is man-made. It's not man's dictates. We, I'm telling you something. If I'm teaching a man-made religion or theology, you hold me accountable. You take me back to my office and you tell me. You have to. You have to tell me. Say, Pastor, that's not biblical. Because my... My number one job as a pastor is when I preach up here is to stay on the word of God. I have to. What I preach has to flow with the word of God. And if it doesn't, please, you got to come to me and let me know. I got to stay biblical. If I'm not biblical, I shouldn't be standing up here. And and it goes to anyone else too. Any other one person here, they got to speak from the word of God. The Bible or tradition? We got to stick with the Bible. It was a Catholic church that decided Sunday should be the day of worship with Christians in the honor of the resurrection, they say. Perhaps the boldest thing, the most revolutionary change in church ever did happened in the first century, the holy day. The Sabbath was changed from Saturday to Sunday, not from any direction noted in scriptures, but from church's own sense of what? Its own power. People who think, this is so funny to me, because this is found in the St. Catherine Catholic Church Sentinel, this is, some, uh, this is some, a writer, a Catholic writer. People who think that Scripture should be the sole authority should logically become Seventh-day Adventists and keep Saturday holy. And this is from a Catholic. The change after changing the day, the rest from Jewish Sabbath, or the seventh day of the first week to the first, made the third commandment refer to Sunday. At, they say the third commandment. Remember I told you the second commandment is gone? Okay, on the Catholic catechism, the second commandment is gone because the kind of the don't make idol thing is kind of a problematic for the Catholics. So it's the third, third commandment. They kept holy as the Lord's day. Daniel, remember Daniel? We talked about a little horn. Think they changed the times and the laws. My friend, um, he's a good friend of mine, and he... 
I'm not sure how he got this job. I have no idea how he got this job. He, he's an illustrator. He draws and stuff. He got a job for a, a Catholic publishing house. Okay? He, he was a, they did newspapers back then or whatever, and he was an illustrator. And uh, they didn't know he was an Adventist. I guess they didn't ask. But um, one time they're having conversations and uh, they're talking about different churches and the topic of Adventist came up, okay? And he was sitting in the room and he says, Danny, it was the weirdest thing because the topic of Adventist came up and then all the rest of the people, oh, those guys, you know? And he's like, those guys? And, and, and basically, he, they, they kind of said, they, they said, those guys are always trying to stay with the Bible. I mean, what's, what's their problem? Okay? They, they need to get on the same page and just say, understand the Pope is the power. You know? And he just kind of like, oh, this is weird. Okay? Um, there is a difference. The, the, they, they, there is a belief that the church is power is supreme. It's, it's real. They believe it. That the, the church has the power. Um, who has the power? God does. Tradition or scripture? Scripture, yes? We got to stick with scripture. The little horn that we found in Daniel is about a, a, a power that decided to get strong and take everything that it could. And the thing he took the most was the law of God. In Revelation 14, 6, and then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel of the preacher of those who dwell on earth, to every tribe, nation, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God, and give glory to him for his hour of judgment to come. We're living in God's judgment. And worship him who made heaven and earth. It's interesting. This is the language of the fourth commandment. Do you see it? Creation here. This is the language of creation. Who made heaven. Which God shall we worship? The God who made us, yes? Remember the Sabbath? In that commandment, who do we worship? Which God? Who created us, yes? This is, this is, this is creation language, okay? Who made the earth and sea and the springs of water. This is the God you worship, our creator. That's the God. In Revelation 14, 12, it says, this is, this is the last grouping. There's going to be last God's people on earth. We're going to talk about next week. This is the last group. Here is the group. Here is their characteristics. Here are those. Here are the saints. Here are those who keep what? The commandments of God, yes? The last groupings of this world, the last people on earth are going to know God's commandments. Is 9 out of 10 good enough? It's not. What does the Bible say? If, if you keep 9 and break 1, what does it say? You break them all right? You can't choose which one you want to break. You keep all of them or none of them. But here is the patient saints. Here are the ones who finally survive to the end. They are commandment keepers of God. And what? And the faith of Jesus. The faith of Jesus. They have both. They love the commandments of God and they believe in Jesus Christ till death. That is a people that will characterize the end. Sabbath is where we find our strength. My friends, if you ever ask yourself, Pastor Danny, I get a little scared. You know, end times is coming and you're preaching this scary end times and you make me scared, Pastor. I'm sorry. I do apologize. I do apologize if somehow talking about the end times gets a little scary. But I hope you'll be ready. But I'll tell you something this. Remembering the Sabbath will be the foundation of your strength. When you can keep Sabbath, okay? I'm glad you're here Friday night. When you can keep Friday night to Saturday night holy, you're preparing yourself for that end. Does that make sense? When you could stand up to your friends, or, you know, my, my friend when I was in high school, he'd call me up. I was the only guy who could drive, okay? I, I had a car, he didn't. Friday night came, he goes, Danny, hey, let's go out. Jeff is having a party. Let's go. I'm like, uh, it's Friday. He's like, uh, what about it? It's party time. I'm going, it's Friday. He's like, oh, yeah, you're an Adventist, huh? Dan, come on. <laughs> I'm going, no. I'm gonna, it's Friday night. I'm staying home. He goes, Jeff's having a party, and Melissa's going to be there, and Nancy's going to be there. 
okay? And I know you like Julie, okay? She's going to be there too, okay? Come on, let's go. And I'm going, sorry, it's Friday night. I'm not going out, okay? And t- but tomorrow, Saturday night when it ends, let's go bowling. He's like, dude, you're cramping my style, okay? You can, he get a little mad at me because I was the only guy with a car, but I told him, I'm not doing it. I, I wanted to see Julie, you know? We didn't have cell phones back then. We were nice to spend some time, get to know her a little bit. Trust me, I was like, oh, Julie's going to be there. But it's Sabbath. And God says, he, he kind of said, Danny, what is it going to be, me or Julie? <sighs> okay, God, you win. Those are type of the tests that he wants you to win every single Sabbath, Okay? Those are the type of the convictions that he wants you to have every single Sabbath. And if you could stand up to those convictions every single Sabbath and make God your God every single Sabbath, when the crazy stuff happens in the end, you'll be ready. You'll be able to stand. You'll be able to resist the devil because you've practiced it. You practice standing up for God, worshiping God, and then the world can't tempt you. When we make light of the Sabbath, I'll tell you this. I'm a pastor. I've been a pastor for over 30 years, and I see this every single time. Every single time. When I see a church member start making excuses for Sabbath, they always leave. They leave. It always starts there. It's like, oh, my son has basketball games, you know, on Sabbath. And I'm like, well, find another thing to do non Sabbath, but I got to be there for a basketball game, you know, soccer, you know, it's Saturday. I'm like, hey, you know, I, I, I don't know. And it always starts there. It always starts something good. I got to go to my soccer game or go to this, that. And a couple years later, they're gone. They're gone from the church because Sabbath has become hmm, maybe not a big deal. My friends, it is a big deal. Sabbath is important. Stand up for it. Represent. Represent God and say, you know what? This is a holy day. These people honor me with their lips. <sighs> but with our heart, they're far from me. Are we talkers? You know? Are we this? We could talk the talk. You walk in it? You know? Like, I'm a Christian. I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. Yeah, you talk. But do you walk it? Do you live it? Do you make decisions? They worship me in vain. Their teachings are like rules taught by men. You're just doing this because you think you're right. You have a fine way of setting aside the commandments of God in order to reserve your, observe your traditions. Throw out God anytime you want. Their hearts are far from me. This is terrible. I hope God never says this about any of you, but this is terrible. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. When we love God, we want to do what God wants us to do, yes? When we love God, we want to, hear the word, be like God. Do you know the word Christian is to be like Christ? Does that make sense? If you say, I am a Christian, it's a big word. Please think about it before you say, I'm a Christian. But if you say, I'm a Christian, it really means, I am a follower of Jesus. And if Jesus, which, who was perfect, holy, and never erred, do you agree with me? Perfect, holy, and never erred. If Jesus Christ was perfect, and he kept the commandments, what do you think, guys? What do you think? Shouldn't we help go that direction also? To observe his commandments also? And his commandments are not burdensome. Please, I want to tell you, Obeying God is the best thing in the world. I think when I was in high school, I was confused. Oh, man, being a Christian is such a pain. You can't do this, and you can't do that, and you can't eat this. Really, that's, that was my view of Christianity. Christianity is can't do this, can't do this, can't do this, can't do this. And I hated Christianity, yes, because it's such a can't-do religion. And I had it all wrong. When you understand God... You're free. 
You can live. You can be. You can be happy. You could be yourself. You don't have to be trapped by the world. You don't have to follow the dictates of the world. You don't have to be anything except who you are, who God made you to be. You are free. I said, wow, there is freedom. I'll show you bondage. Bondage are those who think they are free. The worst people in the world are the people who do everything they want. Just think about that for a minute. The most unhappiest people in the world are the people who do everything they want to do. Just think about that. Why that makes sense. There are people who want to do everything they want to do. You know what they say? Like the Rolling Stones, Mick Jagger, I get no satisfaction. The world never gives any satisfaction. The world is a lie. You think all the fun, all the activities, all the money, all the drugs, all the sex, all the rock and roll will make you happy? No, it doesn't. It brings misery and pain and nothing. With God, everything. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, shall enter my kingdom of heaven, it says, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven, those who do the God's will will enjoy eternity. That is the blessing of God. The heart of his commandments is the Sabbath. And Sunday is an illusion. It's an illusion to the world that you can have both. You can have the world and you can have God. And that, well, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard. God does not want to share you with the world. He wants you, all of you, because he wants to bless you, all of you, not just some of you. And the Sabbath is how it starts. Tomorrow we continue this thought in the Mark of the Beast. Because as a pastor, I'm seeing things happen that, you know what? Wow, that's some weird stuff happening. You know, there's a meeting in Rome in next month. No, this month, some, some climate meeting. I've seen a website. It says, like, Sunday for peace. Sunday for climate change. I'm like, okay, this is scaring me a little bit, you know? Keep Sunday holy, you know, have less Less climate change, you know. Everyone turn off your cars on Sunday. I don't know. It, it, it's some strange stuff is flying around, okay? And it's happening real time in 2021. If you don't believe me, oh, I can show you stuff. But tomorrow we'll continue this. But the Lord is good. He's got our backs, and we don't have to worry. I'm going to stop here. We'll see you tomorrow. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this message that you're a good God and you love us, that you never leave us unprepared, that this world with all deceptions, we do not have to worry because we have a God who is true, who is holy, who is perfect, and we never have to worry about where we'll be. Father in heaven, we thank you for the Sabbath. Help us enjoy this day. May this day be the best day. May this day be a day to recharge, to reinvigorate, to reconnect with our heavenly Father. We thank you. We pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Danny, for that wonderful message. It's, um, it's, it's sobering thought to think that the church or that any one person can make decisions and replace the authority of the Bible or the authority of God. That's just not our place as, the, as created beings. Um, I was listening to the to the story of, of how they were talking about Adventists and how they could, you know, they're so caught up with the Bible. I thought if the worst complaint you have of me is that I'm too biblical, that's a wonderful place to be. Um, for those that are wondering, you know, how do I uh, observe the Sabbath the right way or perfectly, I, I encourage you to to not worry so much about resting perfectly, but rest in the one who is perfect and let him guide you. That's our Sabbath evening, or the start of our Sabbath, right? It continues until tomorrow. That's our service for the rest of tonight. We'll see you tomorrow morning as we continue this thought with the Mark of the Beast. It gets more interesting as we unpack all of the things regarding the Sabbath. You'll see more and more how important and crucial it is as we move forward. Blessings to all of you. Have a great night.